Hello to you all. You all know me. I'm Professor H. Srikant. You have been listening to my YouTube lectures as part of the lecture series in political theory. You can find all my lectures on Marxism and critical political theories in my YouTube channel lecture series in political theory. Of late, I am focusing on classical and contemporary liberal political traditions. Today, I am introducing to you John Rawls' idea of justice. You know, classical liberalism initially found expression in the writings of uh, contractual thinkers like Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. In the 19th century, classical liberalism reached its pinnacle in the writings of uh, J.S. Mill. But in the first part of the 20th century, with the rise of totalitarian ideologies, liberal philosophy lost its glory. It is true, D even during the uh, interwar period, scholars like John Dewey, Max Weber, Hobhaus, Ludwig von Mises, and others, were writing in defense of uh, liberal philosophy. However, the behavioralist tradition that took shape in the 1950s and 1960s ridiculed traditional political theory as a whole, including the liberal tradition. Behavioralist scholars were then talking about the decline and our demise of a political theory. It was during this crisis period that one book of John Rawls, A Theory of Justice, published in 1971, caught the imagination of the scholars around the world and set in motion the revival of a liberal tradition in political theory. Who is this John Rawls? Why did his book receive so much attention? Let us understand. John Rawls was a scholar from Princeton University. He served also in different uh, prestigious universities in different capacities, in Oxford University and MIT. Several thousands of articles and books are written on his contributions. Much of what we study as contemporary political theories revolve around eh, the ideas of uh, John Rawls. One may appreciate or criticize, but no one can ignore Rawls' ideas. Rawls did not stop with this one book. Reacting to his critics, he came out with another book in 1991 titled Political Liberalism. In this book, and also in several articles that preceded and followed, uh, he elaborated his idea of justice. He discussed uh, how one could reconcile different outlooks and build an overarching consensus in the political society. For students of political theory, it is necessary to understand the basic contributions of John Rawls. 
in this lecture i'll be focusing on his idea of justice and in the next lecture i will concentrate on the ideas that he expressed in his next book political liberalism you are all aware that in my youtube lecture on introduction to classical liberalism i discussed different theoretical perspectives within the classical liberal traditions the first liberal thinkers as i said hobbes and locke were social contractualists who espoused the idea of a state of nature and social contract but in the 19th century liberalism took the utilitarian route with thinkers like bentham and j s mill making the principle of a greatest happiness of the greatest numbers as a rationale for liberalism utilitarian nism uh, continued its hegemony for quite long time uh but whenever you say mm, liberalism in 20th century it was mostly looked at from utilitarian angle john rawl felt that utilitarianism cannot be the basis for liberalism for what is good for the most may not be good for all he felt that the emphasis on the principle of the greatest number may result in marginalization of the concerns and interests of uh, the minorities what benefits the free man may not be the in the interest of the slaves development of uh, mainstream india for example need not be in the interest of uh, india's periphery similarly enlargement of uh, national wealth may not be uh, uh, leading to the uh, decrease of uh, income inequalities hence he sees the need for a system where government and state state institutions balance the imperatives of justice and also economic development hence rolls actually discards the utilitarian model espoused by the likes of js mill and argues for or revives the contractarian logic huh? because he feels contractarian logic is a better guarantor of uh, people's rights rolls he asked this question how in a condition of relative scarcity the resources are to be distributed you know it is a fact that at this moment uh, everything that all people want cannot be satisfied there is scarcity in this condition of scarcity how do you distribute the resources for example there is one cake you cut one cake should we give this same size pieces to everyone or should someone who is needy should get more and others less or should someone who cut the cake take the last piece and ensure more for himself so give little little to everybody and keep lord chunk to yourself and have it what is the best way of uh, distribution of the resources or the cake he 
looks at how different uh, uh, people espousing different ideology utilitarians market libertarians and socialists look at the problem of distribution and on the basis of his analysis he puts forward his own theory of justice he thinks that his idea of justice which he bases on a contractarian model is more rational logical and practical whenever we talk of a social contract we contra we confront with these questions what is this contract that the contractualists speak of at what point of time in history this contract took place and all that hmm? so we also criticizing social contract uh, uh, sometimes we say oh such a contract never took place in history let it be made clear that even when hobbes and law floated the idea of a social contract they did not invoke history when they floated the idea of state of nature or social contract they were pointing at a hypothetical situation as to what rational individuals do when they had to interact with the one another and live in a society this is how one needs to understand even john rawls when he floats the ideas of a original position or espouses the principles that the individuals agree to under what he says the wheel of ignorance rawls theory of justice establishes basically the principles that rational human beings arrive at through some kind of contracts in what he calls original position what is this original position original position is something like state of nature like kant rawls assumes that individuals are rational and autonomous his theory proposes a situation wherein rational individuals meet to decide on the rules of the game under the wheel of ignorance here the individuals know who they are but they are oblivious or ignorant of uh, the social status class in a position intellectual capabilities aspirations and interests of others with whom they need to be so they don't know where they stand vis-a-vis others they have no idea whether they are better off or worse off than us in such a situation Rawls says rational individuals are likely to set rules or procedures that ensure for themselves maximum liberty wealth and opportunity but at a minimum risk hmm? so rawls considers that these basic considerations of rational individuals will compel them or drive them to accept his two principles of justice john roll defines justice as fairness and espouses two interconnected principles of justice they are as follows the first one says each person is to have an equal right 
to the most extensive total system of equal basic liberties compatible with a similar system of liberty for all i repeat it again each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive total system of equal basic liberties compatible with uh, a similar system of liberty for all the second one argues that social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they work out to the greatest advantage of the least advantaged provided offices and positions are open to all under the conditions of equality of opportunity i repeat this second principle again social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they work out to the greatest advantage of the least advantaged provided offices and positions are open to all under the conditions of equality and opportunity now let us discuss these two principles a little more elaborately the first principle is simple to understand it speaks of uh, basic political and civic liberties especially uh, rights such as right to vote right to public office for all and includes what we uh, understand uh, as fundamental rights such as freedom of uh, speech assembly consigns property and freedom from arbitrary arrest etc rawls says that uh, when it comes to these uh, political and civic uh, liberties uh, everyone should be entitled to as much liberty as others have neither more nor less in a way this principle endorses uh, what we also know as the rule of law hmm? so th this is something which uh, uh, the classical liberals are aware of it already but the more complicated one is the second principle which is which he is called difference principle rawls discusses here how resources such as property wealth self respect etc are to be distributed he here he argues that inequalities can be justified on two grounds first if they work out to the advantage of the least advantage and second if the people are ensured of equality of opportunities as evident from equal access to education and to office for all rawls is no socialist he does not say that all should have equal wealth or property in his view institutionalized inequalities which affect people's life prospects are inevitable in any society to put it in his own words differences in life prospects arising from the basic structure are inevitable and it it is precisely the aim of the second principle to say when these differences are just so he says that inequalities 
exists. But the question is whether these inequalities are justified or not. He says, unequal distribution is justified if the positions are open to all, provided everyone has access to education and enjoys equal freedom to compete for offices and positions, then the resulting socio-economic inequalities are not only justified, but they work out to the advantage of the least advantaged. He believes that well, in a system where everyone has access to education and no one is denied access to uh, office offices on account of his class or caste or region or race, then inequalities, if they still exist, it is okay and they actually motivate and inspire the disadvantaged people to work hard and improve their position and status. That in turn is uh, actually improves efficiency and works out to the advantage of the society as a whole. So, Rawl doesn't contend that uh, inequality per se is wrong. He argues that inequality is justified if lessening the inequality would make the working man even worse off than what he is. His presumption is that Inequalities actually provides incentives, incentives to work hard and contributes to efficient economy and speedy industrial growth or development. So lessening inequalities sometimes result in lowering or preventing the life prospects of a the laboring class hmm, from further improvement. So, he actually, what he says is that the distribution, even if it is unequal, is justified, provided these following conditions are met. What are those conditions? First, markets should be left competitive. Yeah? It should be kept competitive. Second, resources are to be fully employed. Whatever resources are there, they must be efficiently put to use. Third, property and wealth should be widely distributed. Hmm? There may be inequalities, but uh, uh, they should not be monopoly. And there should be appropriate social minimum guaranteed to all. Everybody should have minimum which actually allows them to live a dignified life. Hmm? Then the fifth one I can say there should be equality of opportunity under right, written by education for all. Hmm? That means that everybody should have education so that uh, they have, they develop their capacities and they are able to compete for offices. And these offices should be open to all. Hmm? So if these conditions are met, hmm, Rawls considers uh, that uh, uh, the distribution is justified even if uh, there are inequalities. Hmm? So, Rawls actually proposes that uh, the basic structure of any society, any society, uh, including political constitution and economic and social uh, institutions, 
should be evaluated on the basis of these two principles of justice. These principles of justice should become the criteria for judging the moral worth of a various distributions of rights and income within a class divided society. And they have to be used to determine how public institutions and practices affect persons' liberties and life prospects. Rawls supports a kind of a welfare and development state which is not averse to transfer payments required to balance market economy and the requirement for decent minimum standards for all its citizens. However, these payments must be limited to the point at which they will not interfere with the efficiency and growth of the productive system. Excessive taxation interferes with the efficiency of the economy and reduces the incentives for entrepreneurial class. It also adversely affects the lower classes also as it kills their incentive to work hard to improve their own lives. Thus, Rawls takes a middle position. He doesn't take socialist position, nor does he uh, take a neoliberal stance. He looks for a welfare state that balances efficiency and welfare of uh, the citizens. To sum up, John Rawls thinks that attaining his version of justice is possible in a constitutional democracy in which the government regulates free economy in certain ways. He advocates government regulation, taxation and income transfer required to keep the economy competitive and at the same time to ensure uh, fair, uh, you can say justice to all. He seeks to balance the imperatives of a purely competitive market economy with the need to provide a decent minimum standard and also to prevent concentration of power to the detriment of liberty and equality. This in a nutshell is Rawls idea of justice. Different scholars rightists, leftists and centrists have reflected on Rawls' idea of justice. More about them in my subsequent lectures. Let me stop here. If you have any queries, comments or suggestions, please write in the comment section. If you like my way of teaching, don't forget to like and subscribe this channel. Also introduce this channel lecture series in political theory to other students, scholars, social activists and professionals interested in political theory. Thank you very much and see you soon.